I'm Leslie Collard. This is my husband, Jamie Collard, and we are the co-founders of Collard Properties and Collard Properties Mutual Fund Trust. Yeah, we just wanted to put together this webinar um, to explain a little more about how funds work, um, the different types of funds, and maybe the reasons why you would set up a fund. And uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of information here to digest from all these experts here. And we want to um, introduce Wendy Russell, the amazing Wendy Russell. <laughs> she is our co-host extraordinaire here, and she is going to be um, kicking us all off with some uh, burning questions. All right, there we go. Thanks, you guys, very much for that. Um, we listen. I, I this is what I know of this conversation. We are about to talk about. Um, funds in that we are now all as real estate investors everybody has proactively pivoted into other things in, because you know the real estate business changes and things shift and so everybody here has used their uh their their genius to to put together these all these funds so i'm learning about this and so I want to uh, talk to all of you so you can enlighten myself and the audience and everyone can learn as we go here. So I'm going to bring up, uh, I'm first going to bring up Lori May. Lori May, welcome, welcome. Um, so you. excited to have you here. Uh, so please in quickly introduce yourself to everybody. Who, who are you? What you do? <laughs> what don't I do might be a shorter list when it comes to real estate investing. Um, I've been um, a proud uh, member of a real estate club now for uh, about nine going on 10 years. So uh, a fairly diversified portfolio. One of the things that's happened over time is the portfolio starts to grow. And when it starts to grow, when you start to get your fingers into a lot of different uh, things, it makes sense to move up into creating a fund. So I've created uh, more doors. Capital Corporation. It is a mortgage investment corporation. It's primarily for people interested in doing um, mortgage lending, but uh, very diversified mortgage lending. Okay, so tell me about this because there's there, there are so many acronyms here. So we've got I, I, what I want to know from you is what's the difference between an MIC, an MFT, and a REIT? Right. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so let's kind of dumb it down a little bit first. What's the same thing about them? They're all uh, securities based exempt market securities in this group. So they're all very highly scrutinized uh, by the securities commissions. These are, um, there's a whole bunch of rules and regulations we all get to follow whether we like it or not. That's part of the joy of running a fund. Uh, all of these uh, uh, from an investor point of view require investor qualification. You can't, you need to be accredited or eligible or friends, family, uh, business associate. Each fund will have specific criteria that they require from their investors. So we employ people to make sure that these criteria are met. These people that are employed can either be in-house or out-of-house. They can be EMDs or they can be financial advisors that are in-house. But you need to go through this scrutiny before you are permitted to invest in one of these funds. It is for our investors' protection that uh, we have to do this, plus the securities department says we got up. So, so we got up. <laughs> so now what are the differences? Yeah. Most people have heard of a REIT. A REIT is a real estate investment trust. It owns and usually operates a real hard real estate-based assets. Usually you hear about them in context of apartment buildings. So a REIT typically will have apartment buildings, a group of buildings that they're managing within one fund and the shareholders are um, sharing in the profits out of them. By the way, investors are called shareholders in our groups so that you have a form of share. So you're, you're a fund shareholder. Doesn't have to be apartment buildings in REITs. It's anything a realist income producing a real estate hard asset based. So it can be land development as well. It doesn't just have to be apartments. You just hear about them more often. So uh, at the end of the day, the shareholders are deriving their dividend, their return from this income producing hard asset. If we're looking at a MIC now, a MIC is a mortgage investment corporation. It's the opposite side of that same coin. 
Uh, whereas a REIT can't lend money or can only lend out limited amounts of money to their overall portfolio, a MIC can only own a limited amounts of hard assets. We lend money. <laughs> we are your mortgage lenders. We provide mortgages that are secured to real estate assets. We lend mortgages to the REITs <laughs> so that they can buy their hard assets. We, our mortgages are interest bearing. So that means that our shareholders are earning their dividends from the interest returns on the mortgages that we put out. Uh, and finally, there's MFTs. MFTs are whatever you want them to be. <laughs> they, they can be structured any way, shape or form. There is no hard underlying, you must own assets, you must do mortgages, you must do this. You can run a freaking hot dog stand in your MFT if you wish, but it all must be very much disclosed. Investors must see paperwork to know exactly what is the um, um, activities that are being conducted to know exactly what they're investing in upfront. All that has to be taken care of before you open the door and accept even one investor. Amazing. Thank you for that beautiful explanation. And I called it an MIC, but you've got it to mix. So I like that. Yeah. <laughs> all right, now I'm learning all sorts of things. This is amazing. All right, um, thank you so much, Lori May. I am going to uh, invite up to the stage now, uh, the lovely, Judy Paré. Where are you, my love? There you are. You're going to help us with how this whole process happens. Tell us about that. Oh, you're going to wait, intro yourself first. Pardon me. Do that. Okay. So my name is Judy Paré and I'm the president of Plentitude. Um, we, my background is in uh, coaching and instructional design and content development. I do a lot of education. That's part of what Plentitude was uh, back in its early days, was an education company. And, uh, and now we focus on affordable housing in Ontario and soon to be Saskatchewan. And uh, what we do is we, we try to build homes in, um, in today's economy with, uh, with the housing prices that we have going on. And uh, just a little clarification, I have a REIT as well as an NFT. And um, although um, uh, Lori May was saying that a REIT and MFT, they're a little bit different, um, and a REIT actually operates as, a, as an MFT. It is designed as an MFT. Um, ours is an, an, an MFT that is an income or investment trust, like Lori May said. Um, so REITs can, um, their, their model or their backbone per se is a mutual fund trust. That is, that's how it operates. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about the process. That's not easy, um, but uh, but it's a great learning experience and it's a, it's a great way to um, to build your portfolio is is by uh, using uh, different types of assets as well. Like most people, when they're when they're starting out or when they're doing partnerships or limited partnerships or shareholder agreements or corporate structures or all of these things that real estate investors do, um, you're dealing with with cash. You're dealing with cold hard cash when you're when you're making those partnerships. But when you go through the process of doing an MFT, a MIC, um, a REIT, whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, you can actually um, dig in, uh, dip into the deeper end of the pool and um, and use registered funds. So registered funds um, can only be used when you're going through this type of investment vehicle through a mutual fund trust or a MIC. Um, so it's important to understand that the you can that that using registered funds requires this securities structure and it requires this type of investment vehicle in order for you to do it. Um, uh, the process of doing it is, is you really just you need to sit down with your lawyers, with your accountants and, and talk to your team and talk about what it is that you're trying to do. The goal is um, is obviously capital raising in these things uh, in, in a MFT or um, a REIT, for example, is to raise capital and to use other people's money. Uh, to do your developments, to buy your apartment buildings, to do and buy vacation properties. You can actually own vacation properties in REITs as well. And there's all sorts of things that you can do. But in order to do that, it's about raising capital. And how do you raise capital and how you preserve the capital of, of, um, of the investors is making sure that they have the right investment vehicle to use. Um, so you do go through the process by working with lawyers and accountants. It takes a long time. You have to do 
you have to outline everything you want. Um, what are your goals and objectives and what are the goals for the investor? And that gets all outlined. Um, one of the really important steps is the declaration of trust of the trust. You, you do the declaration first. Nothing happens until the declaration is done. And then you have a subscription agreement that goes with that. And then you have an offering memorandum. So the more public you go with it, the more documentation you need. So that's really important to understand is, is um, if you're going to a, a wider audience other than your friends, family, business associates, or accredited investors, um, for example, non-qualified or non-friends, people you don't know, strangers, the general public, you do have to have an offering memorandum. So each one of these layers or each one of these steps takes time. And some of the things that are happening at the same time and you're building it and you're designing the documentation and you're doing all of that, what's really important to understand is that this doesn't happen overnight. It takes several months, sometimes, um, sometimes eight months to 12 months. It could take that long for you to get all of those ducks in a row. And the reason for that is because it is a very legitimate legal process that that is governed. And so, you know, anything that is governed has to be managed. And when you're managing something of this nature, um, there are a lot of I's to dot, a lot of T's to cross and a lot of um, oversight. And so that's why it takes so long. And the process is, um, is I, I think, um, necessary absolutely necessary to make sure that everybody is protected and that steps are taken because there's there's even audits before you launch like you go through this process and you're audited before you even start you know they want to see your bank accounts they want to have an audit of it they want to know what you started with what you didn't start with there's things when you have assets they need to know what are they worth like how do you how do you determine that worth so there's valuations there's you know, I was just looking at a document today and it was about a 10 page document on all of the things I needed in my OM, uh, my offering memorandum. And each one of them has multiple paragraphs that go with that. So in the end, you end up with a hundred page document. Like it's yeah. just, you know, it's not something that happens overnight and it's, and it's iterative. So it grows as you're going through the process, right. you're adding things to it. So anyway, so that's, Long-winded, but just <laughs> understand there are many moving parts and yeah. many people involved in this. Yeah, now you've it is got a highly regulated. Yes, uh, vehicle. Yes, absolutely, um, and which is the right way, the right thing to do, obviously, <laughs> to protect mm -hmm. the the consumer, your purchaser, your shareholder. Um, you have two MFTs, so why did you do that? Why did you go with two? Well, Lori May said something really interesting, which is exactly why, is um, one of them in ours is solely for development. We have uh, an MFT, a mutual fund trust that is for development projects. It is project based. So our investors can go in to the project based um, mutual fund trust and they can just invest in that specific project. Those projects, when they come to an end, so a natural end where we either sell the product that we've built or we put it in a uh, real estate trust, we put it in the, the income trust. When it comes to an end, we then um, exit the limited partnership and, and exit all of these folks. So that is in our mutual fund trust, that's our development trust, is for development only. The other, the other MFT we have is our real estate income trust. Anything that we are keeping, building, buying and holding, or buying to keep, is in our income trust. It keeps it very separate. One has an exit at the end of it and the other has a long life. And so that's why we have two because right. the products that we build or buy have different end results. So right. we needed to, to develop two of them. That's awesome. I love that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that clarity. That was amazing. I so appreciate, we appreciate you being here. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, the... Uh, Another power couple we have here. Uh, how about Deanna and Darcy Boyden? Welcome, welcome. Thanks for uh, hanging out. Tell, tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Uh, thanks, Wendy. And thanks to Leslie and Jamie for putting this together. I think it's great, very informative. We're giving a, a lot of fantastic answers to questions we know are out there. A little bit about us, Darcy and Deanna Boyden. We, uh, our REIT is WealthShare, and it came about just over a year ago uh, as we were looking for 
the the really the way to use uh, people's registered funds to help invest in projects or buildings, apartment buildings in Calgary. So so far, we've uh, acquired two different projects, and um, we're always looking for more. We're in Calgary; it's we're we're playing in our own backyard here right now, but we're open to looking elsewhere as well. Amazing. Hi, hi, Deanna. <laughs> Hey, Miss Wendy <laughs> and everyone. Anything else you want to add? I mean, I think your background too, right? You wanted to share that you guys have been investing for over 20 years. And so this was just another way for you to uh, to grow, but also to help others. Yeah. You know, the, the thing is, um, and uh, we were approached with opportunities to do bigger things. And I worked for CMHC years ago when REITs were first taking off. And I remember sitting there in my office downtown, looking at all these buildings that, you know, all the big businessmen owned, um, but loving the idea that anyone could invest in this and that you could use your retirement savings to invest almost any amount, right, in, in a project. So, you know, our evolution as investors we were obviously investing in our projects and other people's projects, but we could now start to, to bring this to life. Um, and, you know, the, the, the ladies have alluded to the, um, the breadth of what you can do within a mutual fund trust. And so you can design it to the purpose. You know, as Darcy said, when we bought our first building last year, um, you know, when you're buying buildings at that price point, we're talking, you know, eight figure purchases. Um, there is you, generally a really long trail to get there. But we bought through a court ordered sale and we had 30 days to close. So we had done all of our due diligence before we walked in there. But you've got to get the investors moving quickly. And 80 percent of people wanted to use our registered funds. So they're able to look at the documents that we have, you know, um, I think duty talked a lot about this due diligence. One thing that we always loved as investors ourselves was the due diligence done on the team, on our projects, on all of that. So you can set these up so that anyone out there can invest in these with a greater degree of understanding of what's going on. So when we were investing, we understood, if you look at that offering memorandum, that 100-page document outlines <laughs> 100 or so pages, maybe more, right, Lori May? Um, it outlines our strategy, our geography. For example, we set up our mutual fund trust to allow WellShare to invest across Canada in residential, commercial, light industrial, that sort of thing. Our strategy currently, as Darcy said, we're focusing here in our backyard. You know, we, our team, we we partnered with a, a, with a realtor and an account accountant, right? So we have this great team all sort of located here. And, and right now we want to invest in Alberta, um, but we can invest across the country. And, and people who look at our offering memorandum understand that. Right. They understand what our experience is. And they know that it's not, you know, we're not just saying we own X amount of doors. Um, you know, there has actually been due diligence done on everything, um, including bank accounts, um, you know, loan to value on projects. So for us, when we were investing in other projects, that allowed us to assess the risk and understand where and what it entailed. And, you know, dollars to donuts, a lot of investors would much rather invest in something that they know more about that is outlined in an offering memorandum um, versus investing with someone who may be able to change their strategy on you. We can't do that because it's fairly well outlined in that offering memorandum. Yeah. Now you for those who are interested in risk, it's, yeah. it's important. Yeah. I, I was going to say, uh, I know you, you've, this has come up for you. It's probably come up for everybody uh, in this, in this, uh, session here, but you, you know, you get the question all the time, listen, I'm ready to invest with you, but why is it taking so long to set up your MFT? So, you know, that yes. I, I like Judy touched on that. It's, uh, it's a, it's, yes. a process. it's tax lawyers, it's security lawyers. Um, it's, it's business lawyers, right? The actual setting up. Um, and then the accountants, 
And then it might come back from the accountants with some edits from the lawyers. And then it goes to the next level because we're also working with exempt market dealers. So your, your EMD, exempt market dealer, may have been involved. Um, we worked with one who helped us with this document. Um, but they still have their own independent due diligence process. So that can take weeks. And then you work with trust companies. So at wellshare.ca, we work with, we started out with two trust companies. We now work with three trust companies. They have their own due diligence as well. They're looking at the, the, the fund. They're looking at the operators. They're looking at the projects. Um, and CRA requires you to get 150 investors um, in, in some of these things. So that is another sort of milestone and everyone's watching for you to do that. You know, we did that. We had investors who lined up with us back last spring and then stuck with us because it took until November. Um, and you have no control. We had very little control over that. We could return our documents. Um, we worked hard, and, and I know that everyone else has as well, to help our investors understand that because we realize we're all learning this. Um, you know, we can share some of this um, with investors, and, and many of you have been so loyal to everyone on this screen in terms of understanding that we would have loved to have had these set up. But it, it took us until November, um, and we crossed our, our CRA threshold of 150 investors, and now someone who has money sitting in one of these trust companies can talk with our licensed dealing rep and the investment is done in a couple of days. Wow. Which is amazing. They have access to all those documents to do their own due diligence again. Um, and it really makes it a, a safer environment, I believe, for people who, who are looking for something where there's a little bit of guidance and a process around it. There is a very clear process with with all of us in terms of the investments that people are making yeah let me just add to, we, we, were, we were investors first so we, we've been through the process many times uh so it helped us uh sort of walk through the process of getting this set up to have other people join us so yeah i think for all of us you know when you look at kyle and, and Lori may specifically on the mortgages their extensive experience there made this better and and i know we you know we've talked about this with judy and the callers we all, we all made changes, things that frustrated us as investors. You know, we, we we wanted to make this. And I think that's why it's important for us to all be on this call today and share some of this. So thanks for including us. Oh my gosh, of course. And I, as you're listening, I am literally thinking that of using the analogy that this is literally like building a house, like the construction process, right? Like it, it takes one person to do the next thing to do the next thing until you actually have this finished thing in front of you. So to use the uh, real estate investor analogy, you know, this is a, you know, we're under construction and building a house and all the things. So uh, uh, counting sure. on those trades, counting yeah. on the trades. Yeah. Absolute mom. Um, so, all right. Thank you guys so much. That was really helpful. Um, I am going to, I'm going to hop over to our lovely hosts here, the collards. Oh, you guys are going last, actually. I think we'll put you guys in last. I'm going to bring up Mr. Kyle Ford. Uh, oh, no, pin the wrong. Hi, guys. <laughs> Cut to, excuse me, technology. Here we go. There we go. All right. Hi, Kyle. How are you today, Wendy? I'm good. How are you? Wonderful. Thank you. Excited thank you to be so much here. for joining us. Oh, this is awesome. So, tell. Tell us a little bit about you. What's your background and how, how you landed here today? Well, I don't know if we have a name for this webinar yet, but I really like the idea of fun with funds. I think that would be <laughs> a, a clever tagline for this. Uh, I like it. To be here. I um, like it. Yeah, no, it's been a, it's been a, a long road to get here, and, and I love what you said earlier about you know, proactively. You know, I look at the people that are on this are, are on this call, and these are all leaders in this space, and understanding that what we need to do to not only help grow our own businesses, but protect our investors and give our investors the opportunity to to grow and scale with us um, in a, in a more sophisticated manner, and, and that's really what the funds are. Um, I know many of us came through, uh, came up through real estate, the real estate education space and, and that world. And if when we started, I, for me, it was in 2015, it was kind of the wild, wild west. 
I mean, everybody in any like one off JVs, all this type of lending. Um, it, it really was very uh, the wild, wild west. And as the, the scrutinizing as the size of our portfolios have grown, the lending has tightened the, the sophistication that we need to offer our investors, our lenders, our, our clients, whatever, however you want to say it needs to improve. And the fund model really, really does that. I want to answer the question, which has been answered a couple of times, but this is what I see with people many, many, many times. Why does it take so long to start this? And what I come back with, with my investor is how long do you think it would take to open a bank? Right. Same well, thing. Well, I, I assume that would take a couple of years. Well, yeah. that's essentially, and we're all a little bit different. And we'll talk about that as well. We're all a little bit different here. Um, but we are, are essentially a private equity or, or in my space, we are a private bank in many ways. So uh, to talk a little bit about who I am and what we do, my name is Kyle Ford. I'm the president and founder of the CapGap Mortgage Trust. So I've been in the mortgage space for a lot of years and I've really seen the, and the, the, this to me, the, my, my, my mortgage trust was the evolution of what I see in private lending. So our underlying legal structure is an MFT. Okay, and I think Lori nailed it. An MFT could be a hot dog stand. It doesn't have to be real estate. It could be it could be whatever you want it to be, as long as you declare and outline what exactly it is you're doing. So we actually went down the road of starting a MIC. We're we're in the mortgage space. We want to lend money, so we started a MIC. Now most MICs, and I know this isn't necessarily the case for 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 Lori May, but most MICs are predominantly lending to people in distressed credit scenarios on single family homes. So they don't qualify at the bank, they lost their job, they financed a Mercedes before closing, they're in trouble, they need a lender. So that's what most mix do, which means you can't lend on more than 50% commercial assets. So if you wanna lend on apartment buildings as a MIC uh, fund manager, you can only lend 50% of your book on those apartment buildings. So we as investor focused lenders, we really didn't like that restriction. So what we did is we went back to the drawing board and we came up with the idea of taking the mutual fund trust underlying legal structure and rewriting it to allow us to do mortgages as long as we declare, which we have in our offering memorandum, that we aren't restricted at the 50% cap. So, here, here's the truth of it too. And it's important to have amazing lawyers and accountants and securities people. But most of these people aren't in the space that you're in. You need to teach them what it is you want to do. They need to give you the legal and accounting advice around it. And you need to work together. One of my mentors said, he, he goes, Kyle, don't be surprised if you know, if, if you know more about this stuff than they do. They know the legal and accounting rules. Making sense why this takes so long. <laughs> this is why it takes so long. They, right. they know the legal and accounting rules, but if they don't understand how your business works and what you're trying to do, you right. need to teach them that, and then we all need to work together. So I used to call them my $5,000 phone calls. There was I had the legal, accounting, everybody on, and I'm teaching, I, I'm paying $500 an hour to you, 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 and you, and I'm teaching you what I want, and you guys are working together to make me legal. So I, I love Lori, how let me research this. So oh, I know I know I'm getting a five thousand dollar bill when I see that. Um, uh, right. The lawyers so, the lawyers get back to you and they're like, let me uh, let me research this for you. I'll be back. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. uh so what what uh what tell me about tell me about oh I was just gonna say, tell me about how liquid MFTs are, because I know you wanted to talk about that a bit. Yeah, so every and this this is also very important where it, I'm not gonna answer that question of how liquid MFTs are because everybody is different. Okay. We need to get away from this is MFTs are this. Okay. Everybody's fund is going to have their own liquidity goals and measures. And okay. so, for example, my fund is an open trust. So you can redeem at any point based on trust liquidity with a maximum of $50,000 on a 30 day notice. Now, there are penalties if you do that before three years. Okay. There are some folks in here who are in who have a development deal yep. and there would be no liquidity in a development deal, right? right? Which is completely understandable. Sure. So there are some hard and fast rules about MFTs, about the legal structure, yep. but the fund that we're operating underneath is gonna have our own rules, guidelines, and stipulations that we all individually operate at. And this is going back to the wild, wild west versus now. 
it's not a handshake deal anymore of, hey, Kyle said I could do this. This is a clearly defined declaration of trust offering memorandum subscription agreement with hard and fast guidelines. So um, th that's a, uh, to answer the liquidity question, everybody's gonna be a little bit different. Yeah, okay, now what, and speaking of liquidity, so what steps should investors take if they're asked to extend their loan or their investment? What, what, what are your suggestions? Oh, well, I wanna answer, so in, in, in the fund space, there should be some hard and fast guidelines and extensions built into that. If you're asking that question in today's private lending world, I want to answer it differently than about funds. Because okay. if you're in an individual private mortgage right now and somebody comes to you for a 30, 60, 90 day extension, you should have no issue. If, if you needed your money back in a year and a day, you never should have done that loan in the first place. Right. So if, if, if you need a night, if, so if your borrower comes back and said, I need a 90 day extension, and assuming the loan's in good standing, assuming, assuming payments are made up to date, there should be no reason that you, you can't say, okay, yeah, no problem, 90 days would work. Now, if you're in an MFT, there should be a clearly defined extension or liquidity uh, uh, model or, or process laid out when you go into this, when you go into the fund. So um, when we spoke about it recently, I, I, made, I, I mentioned to this group that uh, if, if somebody comes to you for an extension on a loan right now, just be happy you're not getting a bankruptcy notice. I, I, I personally received three from people and I'll tell you, it's scary. Now we've been able to recover those loans and recover those debts, but if somebody's coming to me for an extension, no problem, 90 days, let's work with it. Let's try, let's try to come up with a solution, so. Yeah, amazing, cool. Anything you else you wanted to add, Kyle? Otherwise I'm gonna um, invite Kathy to I, I think I would ju just finish with that where, uh, well, I, sorry, I think I do want to add one more thing. Um, there's a lot of talk about how the MFTs are being, are for me. So yeah. I, Kyle did an MFT because it's easier for him. Judy did an MFT because it's easier for her. We're doing MFTs because it's better for us. Here's what I'll, it is better for me in terms of the scalability of my business. Sure. It's less small little deals, one more, uh, uh, vertical integration structure. So there are benefits to me, but the main reason is for my investors. There's more diversity, there's more security, it's more professional, there's more better tax reporting. Everything about this represents the future of real estate investing and away from that wild, wild west that we came from. So and if anyone says there's no benefits to us of having an MFT, that's not true. There are benefits. It gives me better vertical integration in my business. Sure. But the, the main reason why I did it is to me, the writing was on the wall in the private lending space. The way most of us were doing it has a shelf life. And, and, and over the next couple of years, I think it's going to get regulated away where you're not able to do it. So I needed to be proactive in my approach in creating a structure that I believe was future proof. So I just want to make sure that the, the folks that are listening to this call, certainly there are benefits from a business growth perspective for me, but the main reason why I did it is for my investors. I love it. Thanks, Kyle. And congratulations on the uh, impending new baby in your Thank future. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's bring up the lovely uh, Kathy Van Dockenberg. Where are you? There you are. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> did everybody see me jump? No. Oh my gosh, our fire alarm went off. I was like, what the? Oh, and you no. know, it's so darn loud. They want to make sure everybody gets out. Um, so I do have a cold and I mean, I'm not going to sound great, but I'll do my you, best. You look fabulous and you sound great. So take it away. Tell us everything about you. Okay, well, I was part of that wild, wild west for many, many years. I think I have a book in the works. It's called What Not to Do in Real Estate. And so, uh, you know, the more we learn, the more we're in this space, um, the better we get at doing things, not wild, wild west. So I've been investing actually for quite a while. I kind of fell into it and I love it. I love all things real estate. Um, I've done just about everything. And now I'm working on a fairly large land development. And so like everybody else has said here, we needed to find a structure that just suited that type of investment a little bit better, that kind of strategy. And we did um, decide to form our own MFT as well. 
And I have to admit, I have never read an OM and I've invested in many, many land development projects and all kinds of other things, but I would suggest everybody read it. I know it's a hundred pages, but just read it. So I'm not going to go into um, all of the, the structural parts of this because it is crazy. Our offering memorandum is now in like month six, I think. I just want to like, you know, oh, bash your head against the wall. It's like, okay, now we need this. Oh, wait, nobody told us we needed this. We could have done this before. But anyhow, that's right. the process. Tell us, tell us why. What do you do? why we should invest in MFTs or any of the other uh, item programs that are out there, the mix, the REITs, all of the things and the, and the benefits of this. Why is this so such a good thing? So Kyle really touched upon it uh, uh, towards the end of his presentation, um, but there are, uh, there are a few others. So one of the benefits is as investors, we actually don't have to buy physical properties and go through all of that and then have to deal with tenants. And it also allows people, just regular people like ourselves to take part in things like apartment buildings, which you know not very many people have 10 or $15 million or would qualify for such uh, in order to own that on their own. Same with land development. Not everybody has $25 million in order to you know build, I don't know, 50, 100, 150 homes or townhomes or whatever it happens to be. So that's a huge benefit of being able to actually take part in that type of strategy. The other benefit, which is fabulous, is the use of registered funds. So anything from our RSPs, our ESPs, Liras, anything, even RIFs. So there's not really an age um I guess, limit, if you will. Well, I mean, obviously you have to be legal to invest, uh, of legal age to invest. But as long as a person qualifies, they can, like my son is investing in my project uh, through a TFSA. And he was able to qualify, obviously, on the family um, exemption. But, uh, you know, what an amazing thing for a person that's that young uh, to be able to start with something. He doesn't have a ton of money, but he put in what he had. And, you know, how great is that, right? Now, when he's 50 and I'm finished my project, I mean, he's going to be wealthy. He'll retire. Um, the other thing about these types of uh, mutual fund trusts, REITs, whatever that we have, is it, most institutions charge either back-ended or front-loaded or how whatever the language is fees in those and we don't see them so we look at our mutual funds and we think oh wow okay i'm making 12 percent but we don't realize that seven percent of that is going to the institution and two percent is going to someone else and by the time all is said and done we end up with like 3.5 percent my sister just did the math oh i shouldn't have said that she just did the math on her rsp and she is making like 1.9 percent right ick I know. So this allows people to come in for a much nicer um, rate and uh, much lower fees because the fees are through the trust companies that they would be investing, uh, putting their funds through their um, self-directed funds. So, for example, Olympia Trust, I don't know if I'm allowed to name names, but, but here I did. They'll have their own fees, but they're very, very reasonable. It's, I think it's something like $175 to set up an account and then nominal fees thereafter. So, and not fee, like a monthly fee. So uh, those are all very well laid out on all of those companies' websites. Um, what else do we have? There is professional management, like Kyle said. Somebody is managing that. And, you know, we have to be very, um, oh, what's the word? Uh, transparent with our projects. We can't just, you know, do whatever we want, take the money and run off with it. We actually have, we are very accountable and there are lawyers and security lawyers and uh, EMDs and all sorts of other people that are governing the money that comes through our, um, our MFT and they want everything. They want appraisals and they want, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So there is definitely a ton of uh, due diligence and it's continuing. It's not like it stops one day. They still have to make sure people qualify and 
Um, so just really good. Um, oh my gosh, my brain is just a little slow today, but just uh, accountability, I guess. Um, also lower minimums. So people can get in, start investing with lower amounts of money and start investing earlier in their life. Uh, so, you know, if a young person maybe has twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000 or even less, a lot, a lot of um, these funds will take quite a bit less, but it allows them to start investing and learn about investing and then continue as they grow. So, you know, maybe 10 years later, they're now fall or come into 150, 250, 500,000. And it allows for that um, a little bit more of, of that financial um, freedom, if you will. Uh, okay, tax advantages, those are there too. Um, so depending on how things are structured, people might be able to take uh, advantage of the way that they are taxed on their money. Um, the offering memorandum does allow people uh, outside of being accredited investors, they still have to qualify, they still have to meet certain criteria, but can definitely, there's, uh, there's just a bigger opportunity for people to invest. Um, a lot of them offer distributions. So whether that's quarterly, whether that's uh, annually, um, some are at the very end of the project, but some offer those dis uh, income distributions, which, you know, can add to a person's current income or retirement income. So uh, just, I think that's all about all I have to say. Um, Amazing. Oh, and there's oftentimes diversification of classes. So one fund can have several classes and be in several projects. So which makes it really great for somebody for just risk management as well. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. Can't tell you're sick. You're amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for showing up today. That was awesome. Um, all right. So what I'm going to do is we're going to bring up our lovely hosts here. And then what I'm going to do before everybody leaves, I want to bounce back to everybody so you can share how people can reach you and, uh, and connect with you. So we'll just, we'll do a, a round the room, uh, share, and then, uh, just tell us how to, how to connect. So I'm just going to bring up Leslie and Jamie Collard. Hello. Hello. You're back. Hello. Hi. Hey. Um, okay. So what I want to talk to you about is the what's involved in the due diligence process of this with the lawyers and the accountants and the EMDs, because as we've learned and heard a lot, it's it is it's a lot. So so tell us everything. Well, I think the, the thing that's most involved is wine and tears, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fair. everybody could probably attest to that one on here. Um, yeah, but, uh, you know, so the due diligence process is, uh, it's one of those things where um, absolutely every penny has to be accounted for before you even go into the deals. So, um, you know, it's a lot of spreadsheets, it's a lot of Excels, it's a lot of going back and forth with the um, accountants and the exempt market dealers and answering questions. Um Plus, it's, you know, you're kind of just left there showing it all, right? Pants down kind of thing where <laughs> they see everything about your company. They see everything about your finances. Um, they want to know exactly how many other investors that you have. And you have to disclose all of that information. Yeah. I mean, they ask for everything. And when yeah. you think they can't ask for any more. Guess what? They can. They're going to ask for more. And it just keeps going. And, and I think Kyle talked about it it's like I didn't know I had to teach them so much about what our our offering is and how it works I thought it was fairly straightforward but I mean you really have to teach everybody exactly what you're doing and it's just you can't imagine how much paperwork yeah we've sent and how many emails and documents go back and forth it, it's just it, it's crazy but on the same side of that it's protecting us. It's protecting the investors. Yes. Um, and, and I mean, it's, I think that's, it's really important yeah. that they do that much scrutiny on you. And, and the due diligence process, I think, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, but it isn't just, it isn't just due diligence with one um, company. So we have to do due diligence with the um, tax accountants. 
um, with our um, advi tax advisors um, on the mutual fund side. Um, we have to do due diligence with the lawyers that are um, setting it up with other lawyers that are looking to, that we're moving properties over into um, our mutual funds. We also have to do the exempt market dealer um, and we're working with two of them. So um, the amount of uh, due diligence just with one of those alone is is pretty intense. So um, our due diligence, I spend um, about 50 hours a week myself um, just on due diligence. Um, and then Jamie helps uh, out with it as well and, and Shar, but that's been going on for what, five months? Wow. Months five wow. months. Yeah. yeah. So, and that's my, almost my full-time job is just due wow. diligence at this point. Yeah. So I think that's more than a full-time job at 50 hours a week. And then you have all the other stuff going on, right? Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Okay. Tell us about the role of the EMD. Cause I, I think may, a lot of people probably don't know that yet. Yeah. So the, yeah, no, the, the exempt market dealer is, is probably one of the biggest players on our team. So essentially um, any investors that don't fall within the friends, family and close business associates, um, we put through our exempt market dealer. Um, there is instances where uh, accredited investors also don't have to um, go through there, but for the most part, um, basically the exempt market dealer is I call them the expert in securities laws. Yeah. So they're the ones that need to know every single detail about um, the investors before they approve an investment. Okay. So they actually um, protect us um, and they protect the investor. So um, one of the big things that, you know, a lot oftentimes we'll get investors that call that say, I have $400,000 in registered funds. Can I put it all in your uh, mutual funds? And we say, no, you cannot. You cannot do that. So um, it is the exempt market dealer's um, job to also identify concentration levels. And a concentration level just means, you know, if you are valued at $400,000, then you should um, be right around about the $40,000 mark um, to invest in one person's fund. So it's about a 10% concentration level is what they're com comfortable with. And well, that's a great, a great way to wrap your head around it and what, yeah. what can work. Yeah. Perfect. And I mean that uh, for the investor, it's, it's, it's in their best interest. And, um, you know, it also does help them diversify, um, as well. And I, you know, I don't want to be responsible for somebody's total net worth anyway. That is, yeah. no. that is not <laughs> what we set fund up for to take yeah. somebody's Last yeah. all of it. I, I think it's simple, right? You just don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah, no. You need to spread it out. Uh, there's lots of mutual fund trusts, lots of other investments you can do. Um, but real estate is really highly regulated about it. I mean, technically, you could put that 400000 if that's your whole net worth, into stocks. And there really it, isn't any regulation to stop no. that. Sure. But don't, you know. Please don't do that. Don't do that. No. But... Um, <laughs> You know, that's where, you know, it is, I would say, safer to invest in a mutual fund trust REIT, any one of these structures, because it is that highly regulated and they are looking out for your best interest and they're not going to let you just buy $400,000 worth of stocks in a company that's going to go bankrupt in a week, right? Yeah. Like it's... And the amount of scrutiny that is placed on, um, on us, the owners of all of these funds um, is good. In my opinion, you know, it is by the time we have an offering memorandum out there, the, these deals have been checked over. There's thousands and thousands of hours that have gone into these deals. So, wow. Um, okay. So, yeah, just a little bit further on the concentration level, then do you want to um, share a little bit more on how that impacts how we invest? Like, is there, is there more to share on that? Yeah. yeah. So, so the way, um, you know, a lot of people, especially with registered funds, they, they just want to park it and leave it um, until they need to, to pull it out and use it or want to, or, or whatever they decide to do with it. So um, for us, um, we also are looking at their concentration um, levels. And I think it is important to educate investors as to what, uh, or potential investors, as to what a concentration level is, why it's there, and how it protects 
the investors and also ourselves. Um, yeah, and I mean, the, the more net worth you have, um, the more, I guess, you are allowed freedom. to decide. Yeah, freedom, that's a good freedom word. I mean, if you have $5 million in net worth, yeah, you can, do whatever you you can essentially do whatever you want. You can put right. your money wherever you want. That's It's not so much regulated at that point. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, I guess more for the, the concentration level is really more for um, the normal people that are investing that uh, make normal incomes and just making sure they don't overextend. They don't really have the maybe investment savviness. Um, yeah. And that concentration level is... Um, the exempt market dealer is actually the one that determines that concentration level. Okay. Uh, the Securities Commission um, and CRA, uh, they like the 10%. There is times where if it's a very savvy investor um, who's been investing in these kinds of deals for you know a decade, then they might be able to push it up to 20 or 25% concentration level. But it's, a, it's very much on an individual basis. Okay. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else? Uh, oh, and uh, well, I've got Judy that wants to pop in. Do you guys want to add anything before we we pop back to Judy, who wants to add to that? No, no, I no, just... I don't, I don't think so. I'm actually, I'm so impressed. I'm learning more from everybody else. I know here. this is so great. <laughs> um, okay, well, first of all, let's. Um, why don't we start with you? Let's. Why don't you tell everyone how they can find you, where they can reach you, how they can invest with you. Yeah, I mean, you can find us at collaredproperties.ca. Um, you can get on there, contact us. Um, we have some information about our mutual fund trust there. So uh, yeah, reach out yep. if you have any questions. Amazing. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. I'm going to hop back to where's Judy Lady. Hello. You would like to add something? Hey. Hi. Yeah. Hi. I just wanted to add something. So really great points here about concentration and saturation and more. Not and um, you know going back to just one of the things that I'm always teaching is about laddering investments. Is yes. um, you know what an interesting question that came up here is what is the term? Well, the in general, um, a lot of MFTs and REITs don't necessarily have terms. They don't necessarily have an end date because it's it's really structured around the construction. If it's if it's a development, for example. Um, it's like some of them are open, some of them are closed, some of them have a term, some of them don't. So it's really important that you see that and that you're laddering your investments. So when you're looking at your portfolio, portfolio, your entire portfolio, you know, and you're putting money here, there and everywhere, which is important is to spread it out and, and, uh, and put it in various places and not just all in one person's basket. Um, one thing to consider when you're doing this also, because some of them have end dates, some of them don't, some of them are open, is really how do you ladder? How do you ladder your investment? And, um, and you can do that by just understanding the timelines of these projects that you're going into. And Kathy made a really good point about different classes and projects, and you can go into a very specific project in different classes. You can also, in a REIT, go into one class, but be in multiple projects. So there's, you just, you have to read the offering memorandum and understand what the language is and what the terms are or how long things are going because a lot of mine, for example, are development deals, even in my REIT, they're development deals that are actually going to be finished in multiple phases. For example, I have one that's a four-year project, but we're building 24 townhomes first, and then the next apartment building, then the next apartment building. And so it's starting to bring in money um, before the project's even done. So I think it's important that people understand when money will be returned to them, uh, how you're going to be taxed on it, like Kathy said about your, you know, typically when you invest in a mutual fund trust, you're getting a return of capital, not necessarily um, an income. And it's when it's an, a return of capital, you're taxed differently. So it's in, it's important to do those things. But I just really wanted to talk about um, just the diversification again, and to think about when you want to invest in, in MFTs or REITs or mix or whatever it is that you're doing is ladder your investments, spread them out, um, and uh, and share you know share the wealth really. Like you don't need to put all of your eggs in one person's baskets. That's why we're all here together is to talk about each other and like and to give each other an opportunity to to also talk about theirs. Like we're we're none of us here in this room want all of one person's money. We want you to diversify. We want you to spread it out, and we want you to to do things that um, 
that create less risk for you. So I just wanted to add that. And that's why we're here together as a group is to say, you know, don't put your eggs all in one person's basket. We don't want that. Amazing. Thank you, Judy. On that note, and let us know how, how can everyone get in touch with you and reach out to all, all things Judy Pere. Yeah, you can go to uh, plentitudeinc.com uh, and uh, or, or just email invest at plentitude inc. Um, every Friday as well, or every other Friday, if you go to our website, we have a private lending discussion um, at one o'clock on Fridays. And it's really not even just about our deals. It's a private lending discussion. Anybody's welcome to come and ask questions and ask about, oh, what does this mean? Or what does that mean? We educate people. So, I mean, just drop in on a Friday and when we'll answer your questions. So that's how you can reach us. Super cool. Amazing. Thanks, Judy. And have a wonderful weekend. I know you're up to a little camp plentitude this weekend. Have an amazing weekend. Thank you. I have to get you up here soon. I know. <laughs> My dates keep conflicting. We'll do this, I swear. Uh, all right, let's bring uh, Kyle up. Hey, Kyle, tell, tell everybody how they can reach out to you, connect with you. Yeah, absolutely. CapCapMFT.com uh, or info at CapCapMFT. That gets you Monique. Uh, Monique can direct you to myself, Anna Scott, Steve Aho. Any one of us are more than happy to connect with you guys. Uh, and then obviously uh, info at Kyle Ford Mortgages for all your standard mortgage needs where myself and team are, are, are here to help. So Awesome. Do you want to spell that out for everybody? Just is it literally CAP, C-A-P and then GAP, G-A-P? Uh yeah, the capital gap in the real estate market, cap gap, C A P G A P M F T dot com. Beautiful. Uh, info at cap gap M F T dot com. Okay. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Absolute pleasure being on here with everybody. Thank, Thank you. you so much. All right. Uh, where is my KVD? There you are. KVD, my love. How can everyone find you? Um, so I, I wish I had something really great to say, but it's just. Kathy at fiveoaksld.ca. I'm also on Messenger, on Facebook, and yeah, just reach out and, and I'm happy to talk anything, real estate investing, um, share my, my projects, other people's projects. Um, yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Go get some rest. <laughs> I feel better <laughs> thinking of you. All right. Uh, I think we are going to bring up Mr. Boyden, who is now solo, I, you're, I saw your lady had to run to another meeting. So the life of a real estate investing. Right. Couple. I know. We, we, get to, we get to split and, and share the screens of other places at times. So <laughs> yeah, um, okay. yeah no, thank you very much. It's been an honor to be here. Share this wonderful session with such great professionals. Uh, if you're looking for more information of WealthShare, it's just wealthshare.ca. And we like to say we're built by investors for investors. So if you're interested in finding out anything in the process of how to invest, whether it's with us or not, you can reach me at Darcy at wellshare.ca. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Darcy. And I'm going to find the lovely Lori May. Where are you? There you are. Hi. Welcome back. Hi, Andy. Thank you. <laughs> uh, to get all the me, please. Yeah, to get hold of me, the easiest way is probably head over to lorimay.ca. Over there, you'll find uh, an REI Sweet Talk page if you want to book in and have a chat, or um, the Sweet li Resources Library is there as well if you're looking for more information about all sorts of investment opportunities, hints and trips for property management, whatever, <laughs> stuff that I'm involved in. Amazing. That is awesome. That makes it really simple. lorimay.ca. Love it. All right, my lady, I'm going to get back to our lovely hosts here. I'm going to, where are we? There we are. Hi, guys. Hi. Wow. Yeah, well, thank you, everybody, for being on here. This has been amazing. I mean, I've learned so much, again, here um, from everyone. And, um, you know, we we appreciate everybody's time. And um, I think I'm speaking for, the, for everybody here, if, you know, just like, uh, Darcy said, if anybody needs any help trying to figure out this whole investing in funds, reach out to any one of us and we will, we are more than willing to help with um, getting you set up, even if it's not in our own funds, there's, you know, we're, we just want to see people you know, being successful in this real estate investing world. That's what it really comes down to. And yeah. thank you, Wendy, for coming on and 
doing your amazing thing like you always do. Oh, thanks, guys. Happy, happy to host for you. Happy to to MC this little this lovely little webinar that we I just I learned so much. Yeah, you guys are light years ahead. So thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom. You're all fabulous, and I adore you all. So, um, so thank you so much, and uh, reach out to these amazing humans that um, can help you invest in incredible um, in investments to build your portfolios.